Okay, welcome to episode four of Reign of Blood, the true story of the epic clash between the Aztec and Spanish empires. Once again, we bit off more than we could chew, and we're going to have to split this next episode on Spain into two parts. In part one, which you're about to hear, we'll take a quick historical tour of the Iberian Peninsula and try to provide some context for understanding what Spain is, at least what it was at the dawn of their encounter with the Aztecs, and also, perhaps more importantly, what it isn't. We're going to dedicate a bulk of the episode to the Reconquista and discuss how it shaped Spanish and, for that matter, Portuguese identity in ways that are still apparent today. As always, we hope you follow along at intellectualbrutality.com where we'll post maps and photos to accompany this episode. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and follow us on whatever platform you're listening to this podcast. And if you're so inclined, please leave a review. It all helps to expand the reach of the pod. And so, with no further ado, here is Reign of Blood, Episode 4, The Spanish Opening, Part 1. They wouldn't have known it at the time, but the handful of Spaniards who arrived in the Caribbean with Columbus heralded the beginning of the world's first truly global empire. They would have also been surprised to learn that they composed the vanguard of Western civilization's march to dominate the planet. We can see all of this clearly in hindsight, of course, but at the time, this understanding of what they were doing would not have made much sense to them at all. They would have even had a difficult time contextualizing the term Spaniard or Spanish as anything but a loose geographical grouping, and they would have identified with the term in the same way Italians and Czechs and Belgians all identify as European today, meaning they would have accepted it as a broad description of where they were from, but not nearly sufficient to describe who they were. Because in all the ways that really mattered, these men, and later women, would have identified with one of a handful of kingdoms that sprouted up during the Middle Ages. Many of those kingdoms had, in fact, been at war with one another within living memory, and would be again periodically into the 1700s. In fact, the idea of a common Spanish identity, let alone a unified Spanish state, has yet to emerge by the time Columbus set sail in 1492. In this way, the Spanish look a lot like the Aztecs, who, while a collection of groups who shared a religion and economy and overlapping political and other institutions, nonetheless considered themselves to be distinct from one another. These Spanish kingdoms had their own kings and queens, they had different nobles and courts, their own armies and bishops. They even had different languages and ethnic makeups in some cases. But also like the Aztecs, they would overcome these divisions that separated them to achieve enough unity, or at least cooperation, to enable them to expand their civilization first to the extent of their natural borders, and then well beyond them. How did they do it? Well, the same way the Aztecs did. With a story. And their story even has a catchy title. The Reconquista. As we talked about extensively in episode 2, all origin stories are a mix of history and myth and outright propaganda, and much of them tend to be crafted well after the events of these stories themselves have transpired. The Reconquista is no exception. The short version of the story, as told by the Spanish and the Portuguese as well, since the Reconquista is also their origin story, is this. Christians who fled the Muslim invasion in the early 700s AD found refuge in the small mountainous kingdoms in the north, where they bravely resisted Islamic armies until they were strong enough to go on the offensive and reconquer the Iberian Peninsula for Christianity, which they finally did in 1492. The long version is, well, a lot more complicated. First and foremost, what you have to understand about the Reconquista is that it wasn't the coordinated, organized crusade that was carefully planned and methodically executed as it's often portrayed. It was much more like an 800-year Cold War with sporadic, intermittent, and largely unrelated outbreaks of fighting resulting in land trading back and forth between Muslim and Christian kingdoms. 
Also, these small conflicts could have been initiated by princes or warlords from either side who were much more interested in increasing the amount of land they controlled than they were about any long-term religious or cultural objectives. The second thing you need to understand is that the Iberian Peninsula has been conquered many times. Every few hundred years, in fact, since it first enters the historical record around 1000 BC, a new civilization has come along and intermingled or displaced the established civilization that was already there. The original inhabitants of modern-day Spain and Portugal were the Iberians, hence the name, and archaeologists have found traces of their civilization as far back as 4000 BC. But we don't know a whole lot about them because the next group that came along were the Celts in about 1000 BC, and they would thoroughly remake Iberian civilization in their own image. We know a lot about the Celts because they were the dominant civilization across Western and Central Europe before the rise of Greek and Roman civilization. The Celts were so prolific that their languages and other aspects of their culture survive to this day, with parts of not only Spain, but France, Ireland, and Britain proudly preserving those Celtic roots. Either right before or right after the Celts overtook the region, the Phoenicians arrived to set up trading colonies along the southern and eastern coasts. The Phoenicians were a Near East Semitic people, originally from modern-day Syria and Lebanon, but they were famous seafarers and traders and set up trading colonies and outposts all across the Middle East and North Africa before reaching Celtic Iberia. The modern-day Spanish city of Cadiz was originally established as the Phoenician colony of Gadir during this period, sometime between 1000 and 800 BC. There's some dispute on the exact date of its founding. Next came the Greeks, who set up their own colonies beginning sometime after 700 BC. And after them came the Carthaginians, who would leave their mark in many different ways. The Carthaginians were descendants of the Phoenicians, and they inherited their western Mediterranean colonies after Phoenician civilization collapsed in the Middle East. From their capital city of Carthage, near the modern-day city of Tunis in Tunisia, they would oversee the colonies along Iberia's coasts and keep that area firmly and thoroughly integrated into Carthaginian civilization. But the Carthaginians never undertook any large migration or military expansions in Iberia, and the region would remain a largely Celtic society, until, that is, in the latter part of the 200s BC. That's when the legendary general Hannibal Barca decided to annex much of eastern Iberia into a new Carthaginian empire to counterbalance the power of a new rival civilization growing in Italy. That civilization took its name from its capital city, Rome. Despite assembling a massive army in Iberia consisting of African war elephants and famously crossing the Alps to invade Italy with it, Hannibal would ultimately lose the Second Punic War with Rome in 2001 BC, opening the floodgates of Roman civilization onto the ancient peoples of Iberia. It would take about 200 years, but by the time of the death of Caesar Augustus in 14 AD, nearly all of the Celtic peoples of Iberia would be thoroughly incorporated into the Roman world to some degree. Inevitably, Roman architecture, art, language, and the steady flow of Roman citizens migrating from Italy followed. And over the next 400 years of rule under the Caesars, Iberia would become among the most thoroughly Romanized provinces of the entire empire. It was also given a new name, Hispania. When the Western Roman Empire collapsed in 410 AD, a Germanic tribe called the Visigoths crossed the Pyrenees and made Hispania their home, which it would remain for the next 300 years until the Muslim Moors from North Africa took it from them in the early 700s. While the degree of their control over the region would wax and wane over the coming centuries, as we'll get into in more detail in just a bit, Islam would maintain a presence on the peninsula for nearly 800 years. And so whether what today we call the Reconquista of Spain was a true reconquest, or just another in a long line of regular conquests by one group over another, is all a matter of perspective. And that perspective depends, of course, on whoever is telling the story. 
Today, many Islamic extremists, for example, lament Islam's loss of Spain in 1492 and vow to reincorporate it into the Muslim world. It's likely any Christian vow to return Spain to Christianity in, say, 900 AD sounded just as ludicrous and irrational to your average Muslim family in Cordoba as any Islamic reconquest sounds to us today. But while much of the Reconquista period has been oversimplified and whitewashed and complex themes and historical processes have been inevitably reduced to fit a narrative that's incomplete at best, propaganda at worst, it did nonetheless happen. And so in order to understand how Spain found itself at the doorstep of global dominance in 1500 AD, we need to paint a clear picture of how Hispania was first lost to Muslim Moorish invaders and how they were eventually expelled seven centuries later. As we mentioned, it was the Germanic Visigoths who would eventually emerge from the chaos that ensued after the Western Roman Empire collapsed in the 400s AD to assert authority over Hispania. But while we recognize them clearly as Germanic in origin and ethnicity, the Visigoths saw themselves as Romanized citizens of the empire. This means they also saw themselves less as Hispania's conquerors and more as a Roman successor state. And they set about ruling Hispania as the continuation of Roman civilization just under new management. The reason they felt this way is because they had enjoyed a degree of assimilation into Roman society for many decades thanks to Rome's Fodorati policy. This was the system where the Roman army would contract barbarian tribal armies to defend its northern frontier in exchange for land in the border region and annual gold payments or other concessions. After a couple generations, these Fodorati would have felt legitimately Roman, at least by frontier standards. Once they took control of Hispania, they did their best to live as they thought good Roman nobles would. They copied Roman institutions and dress. They adopted Roman religion, which by this time was Christianity. They duplicated Roman titles and offices, and like the Franks and the Burgundians to the north and the Lombards and the Ostrogoths in Italy, they adopted Latin, the Roman language, at least their best interpretation of it. Though the Visigoths did their best to imitate Roman civilization, Roman prosperity did not follow for the general population. The Visigothic elite became decadent and detached toward the end of their run, and everyday life in Hispania descended slowly but surely into small-scale but persistent internecine warfare between petty fiefdoms, which resulted in pervasive poverty for your average citizens of Visigothic Spain. The light that had been Rome dimmed across Hispania, as it did across most of Western Europe. By the end of the 600s, Visigothic rule was tenuous at best. Groups like the Basques and the Asturians and the Galicians and dozens of smaller groups began asserting a degree of autonomy. They would have acknowledged the rule of the Visigothic king in their capital of Toledo, but the realities of medieval life meant local lords and nobles were the only real power centers that mattered to most people's daily lives. In 711, things went from bad to worse, and they did so quickly. A Muslim army from the Umayyad North African region under the command of Tariq ibn Ziyad crossed the Straits of Gibraltar, separating Europe from Africa, and began raiding the southern coastal cities of Hispania. The Visigothic king, Roderick, was in the north fighting the Basques, but he quickly gathered an army and marched it south to meet the 8,000 invaders. At the Battle of Guadalete River near Cadiz, Roderick's army was crushed, and Roderick himself was likely killed in the battle. News of his success reached the Muslim heartland in the Middle East, and a year later, Tadic's mostly North African Berber and Moorish force was joined by a more formidable 20,000-man army composed of core Arab units sent directly from Syria and Egypt. Toledo was soon sacked, and all the Visigothic nobles who remained in the city were publicly executed. By 717, Muslim armies had reached all the way to the Pyrenees and the northern Atlantic coast, and they began making raids into modern-day France. Most of the ruling Visigothic elite, however, didn't stick around to witness it, let alone resist it. As the strength and the scope of the Muslim invasion became clear, they packed up and fled north, finding refuge in the small kingdoms and territories up in the high valleys of the Pyrenees and Cantabrian Mountains a little further west. 
The area was remote and rugged, and the terrain made it difficult for large armies to operate, especially Muslim armies that favored the kind of sweeping cavalry warfare more suited to open plains and deserts. The region of Asturias in the northwest proved especially stubborn. They managed to resist full incorporation into the Muslim world. As long as they agreed to pay the jizya tax, Muslims allowed Christian client states to pay to avoid conversion and conquest. They also had to recognize the caliphate's rule across the rest of Hispania, which by this time had yet another new name, Al-Andalus. Because Asturias managed to remain outside the caliphate, it became a favorite destination for those Christian Visigothic refugees. And in 718 AD, one of those Visigothic nobles by the name of Pelagius took control of Asturias, formally declared it a Christian kingdom, and announced they would no longer pay the Jizya tax. Many Visigoths and other Christians rallied to his banner and prepared for the inevitable Muslim onslaught, which came a few years later in 722. A Moorish army on its way back home to Al-Andalus from a raid into France decided to head to Asturias to crush what they saw as Pelagius' rebellion. As they pressed up into the Cantabrian mountains, Pelagius' small army very cagily retreated, luring the larger Muslim force into a narrow valley near the town of Covadonga. When the time was right, they ambushed the Muslim army and routed them. To the Moors, Covadonga was just a small skirmish, and losing it resulted in no real change to the status quo. The way the Christians tell it, however, this was a monumental victory, and later generations of Christian armies would draw inspiration from Covadonga and point to it as the end of the Muslim advance and the beginning of the Reconquista itself. Practically speaking, all the victory at Covadonga did was beat back one of many Muslim attempts to bring the lawless Cantabrian region into the new caliphate. And so it's unlikely that Covadonga at the time was seen as the major turning point of Christian resistance and the end of the Moorish conquest, let alone the beginning of something that would be sustained and spread. But history is hindsight, of course, and looking back, Govadonga does provide a convenient and rather poetic turning point in this origin story, even if later generations piled meaning and symbolism onto it that didn't exist at the time. Just to give you some small idea of how potent a cultural touchstone the Battle of Covadonga remains, there's a specific cross design called the Victory Cross, which, according to legend, was the design of the cross carried by Pelagius. Today that cross is on the flag and the coat of arms of the modern autonomous community of Asturias, 1,300 plus years removed from the battle. We'll have a photo of the Victory Cross on the website for you to reference. The Muslims, who at this point were known officially as the Umayyad Caliphate, didn't seem overly threatened by Asturian resistance even after the setback at Covadonga. They began regular raids over the Pyrenees into modern-day France, what were then the kingdoms of Aquitaine and Burgundy, and they even conquered the kingdom of Septimania, which straddled the Pyrenees along the Mediterranean coasts of both Spain and modern-day France. This also brought them into contact with the mighty Franks for the first time. One Umayyad army penetrated deep into France and camped about 130 miles outside of modern-day Paris, but they were defeated not long after that at the Battle of Tours by a Frankish army under the command of General Charles Martel, also known as Charles the Hammer. Successive Frankish kings would push the Muslims out of Septimania and then back over the Pyrenees by 760 AD for good. Charles the Hammer had a grandson, also named Charles, otherwise known as Charles the Great or Charlemagne. Maybe you've heard of him. Charlemagne was expanding Frankish territory all over Europe, and he decided the time was right to project into Al-Andalus. And so starting in 778, he launched a series of raids and incursions over the Pyrenees, through the Christian-controlled areas, and into Umayyad territory. This offensive was designed to make an impression not just on the caliphate down in Cordoba, but on the many Christian kings and dukes as well many of whom claimed territory and titles north of the Pyrenees in areas that Charlemagne now controlled. Charlemagne was in the early stages of building what would become the Holy Roman Empire, and he had the backing of the Pope. 
and it was important that the Christian nobility of Europe recognized his ascendancy, as much as the Muslims and caliphs and emirs did. By 800 AD, he had brought most of the Visigothic-ruled proto-kingdoms, some unwillingly, into a loose confederacy called the Spanish March, which formed a buffer zone along the southern slope of the Pyrenees separating Muslim al-Andalus from Frankish Christian-controlled Europe. One of the perhaps unintended consequences of the Spanish March was that it effectively ended whatever Visigothic character the resistance movement may have had up to that point. The Visigoths, as we mentioned, were always an elite minority whose numbers were never all that great. And over time, as Frankish control of the Pyrenees region loosened, the administrative areas Charlemagne set up would emerge as independent kingdoms detached from any Visigothic claim or past. The nobilities of each of these kingdoms would soon evolve away from each other as well, and so any Visigothic kinship they may have acknowledged before the Spanish March period is largely gone by the end of Frankish rule. In other words, by 1000 AD, the Visigoths are no longer a perceptible, distinct political or cultural unit. And from here on, Christians in these northern areas would identify with one of these new kingdoms. On top of this, as we approach 1000 AD, there's little to suggest that a unified reconquest was underway, certainly not one driven by an aggrieved Visigothic population looking to retake their land and reinstall a rightful Christian king over all of Hispania. It's doubtful that anyone in a medieval army serving one of these early Christian kingdoms would have considered themselves part of a coordinated centuries-long project to take back the area for Christendom. For the duration of Muslim rule in Al-Andalus, in fact, these Christian kingdoms were just as likely to be at war with each other as they were with their Muslim neighbors. And Muslim emirs and princes actually grew adept at playing these Spanish kings against each other for their own advantage. Your average Christian soldiers, too, were just as likely to serve as mercenaries for Muslim emirs and generals, even when they went to war against Christian armies. The most famous example of this dynamic is that of the semi-legendary hero of this period, known by his nickname, El Cid. Born Rodrigo Diaz de Vivar to a mid-level noble family in 1043, El Cid emerged as a great general for King Sancho of the nascent kingdom of Castile which had only recently carved itself out of the much larger kingdom of Leon. He was reputed to be undefeated in battle, and early on he was called El Campeador, the champion, by his men. But when Sancho died without an heir in the 1070s, Castile was folded back into Leon, and El Cid had to pledge his loyalty to its king, Alfonso, who he had just defeated in battle. This arrangement was never going to work, and after a series of mishaps and court intrigue, Alfonso sent El Cid into exile, and so El Cid went into the service of the Muslim ruler of Zaragoza in northeastern Al-Andalus. The rule of the Umayyad Caliphate had deteriorated by this point into small independent Muslim states, and the emirs of these taifa states, as they were called, looked for knights wherever they could find them. The emir of Zaragoza scooped up El Cid, and he led his Moorish armies to victory over the Christian kingdom of Aragon in key battles. It was from Muslims that he earned the nickname Al Cid, which means lord or master in Arabic. Other translations include gentleman, so it was clearly an honorific meant to convey great respect. When the armies of a new caliphate, the Almoravids, invaded Al-Andalus to restore Muslim rule and check the advance of the northern kingdoms, King Alfonso of Leon tried to call El Cid out of exile to lead his armies against the expected Almoravid offensive. But El Cid decided to stay on the sidelines at first, and then, seeing an opportunity, conquered Valencia, then still a Muslim city, for himself. El Cid is a fascinating historical character, and he's achieved semi-legendary status, as we mentioned, kind of like the King Arthur of Spanish history. But we don't have time to go into much more detail here. Just know that he's illustrative of how confusing the state of play was in Al-Andalus around 1100 AD, and how divided the Christian kingdoms were during this period, and even going forward. 
the Almoravids did restore order and solidified their frontiers with the Christian kingdoms for a time, even pushing them back north quite a bit. But then came the Crusades around 1100 AD, which whipped up anti-Muslim fervor all across Europe. Most soldiers who took up the cross joined armies headed for the Holy Land, but many realized they could fight Muslims much closer to home, and so peasants and noble knights alike made their way over the Pyrenees to join the Christian armies in Al-Andalus. Now, for the first time, perhaps, a true religious motivation could be ascribed to the wars between the Spanish Christian kingdoms and the Muslim establishment in Al-Andalus. By the early 1300s, most of the collection of as many as 10 distinct Christian kingdoms that emerged from the Spanish March period had, through wars or intermarriage or both, consolidated into just three. Portugal in the west along the Atlantic coast, Aragon in the east and northeast with most of the Mediterranean port cities under its control, and Castile, the wealthiest and largest of the three occupying all the land in between them, including the important trade and religious centers. It was Castile which would eventually conquer the wealthiest and most prestigious of the Muslim cities in the south, like Toledo and later Sevilla and Córdoba. Of the three, Portugal would emerge with the largest degree of political and cultural unity, and this would help them become the first modern nation-state in Europe. But both Castile and Aragon were chaotic collections of small to medium-sized feudal entities ruled by rival counts or dukes from a maze of noble families. The clearest, but certainly not the only example of this dynamic, is the example of Catalonia, which enjoyed a degree of independence that would foster the beginnings of a distinct identity and a sense of nation. But they were ruled, or at least administered, by the Kingdom of Aragon, and tensions would never really subside. It was this political infrastructure that was more or less in place until about 1450. And here, even with the Muslims clinging to their last strip of territory along the southern coast, and the rest of the peninsula now firmly in Christian hands, there's little to suggest that Spain is beginning to coalesce into a single political or cultural union, let alone that it's a generation removed from the advent of a global empire. There isn't even an agreement on a common Spanish language yet. As many of you, I'm sure, are aware, the language we call Spanish is actually called Castilian, or Castellano. Castellano, for any listeners from Argentina or Uruguay. The Romans, of course, first brought Latin to Hispania, where it became the dominant language just about everywhere, except for a few isolated pockets in the north and west. The Visigoths came next, as we mentioned, and they adopted Latin when they took over, and it would continue to evolve under their influence for an additional 300 years, until the Moors arrived and made Arabic the dominant language by the mid-700s. The Latin language followed the fleeing Christians north, where it would splinter among the small, isolated kingdoms of the Spanish March, to the point that, over time, you have multiple distinct variations of vulgar Latin that emerge that were as different from each other as, say, Italian is from French today. Castellano, then, was the version of Latin that emerged among the people of the early kingdom of Castile. Since Castile would emerge as the dominant kingdom during and after the Reconquista, it's the language that became dominant and would eventually be exported around the world. But as late as the 1600s, and even later in fact, there are as many as a dozen different dialects of Latin actively spoken and written across the Iberian Peninsula. And they're not all mutually intelligible either. Modern forms of many of those dialects remain the first languages of many Spaniards to this day, including and especially Catalan spoken in and around Barcelona, Galiciano in the far northwest of Spain, which has more in common with Portuguese in many ways than it does with Castilian. Valenciano, which is a close relative of Catalan, spoken along the Mediterranean coast around Valencia. The Basque language in the far north of Spain that comes from a completely different language family and predates the arrival of Latin. And, of course, Portuguese proper, spoken in Portugal. We saw with the Aztecs how a common language, in that case Nahuatl, went a long way towards uniting people who consider themselves to be otherwise distinct from each other. But in Spain, we see the opposite. We see how disparate languages 
can be a huge obstacle toward unifying people who are otherwise very similar. And today, as during the 1500s, Spain's fractured politics can in many ways be traced to this lingering language barrier and the cultural barriers that come with it. Language and other divisions aside, however, the pursuit of the final conquest of the remaining Muslim strongholds and the prestige and wealth that would come with it would eventually resume in earnest after petty dynastic and political squabbles were finally settled. By 1450, all that remained of the once brilliant Muslim civilization of Al-Andalus had been reduced to the small emirate of Granada, which clung to the southernmost region of the Iberian Peninsula as it awaited its fate. That fate was sealed in 1469 when Queen Isabella of Castile married King Ferdinand of Aragon, unifying the two crowns and, more importantly, unifying their armies and their resources for the final phase of the Reconquista. The defeat of Granada and the final conquest of the Muslims came just over 20 years later, in 1492. The union of the two self-branded Catholic monarchs ushered in a new period of wealth, prosperity, and global prestige for the nascent Spanish Empire. But the two kingdoms remain markedly divided. Each monarch and their respective nobles continued to rule their own kingdoms separately. They retained their own currencies, their own political bodies, separate legal institutions and courts, and their own distinct languages. They even maintained their own foreign policies, with Aragon focused on dominating the Mediterranean and expanding the empire's influence in Italy, and Castile pursuing dynastic unions across Europe and consolidating its power in the south, where the wealthy former Muslim cities were, as well as the highly developed agricultural land around them. In addition to these political and linguistic divisions, there were some significant ethnic and cultural differences as well, particularly among the recently conquered citizens of Al-Andalus, who were by now subjects of Castile, Aragon, or Portugal, and many of whom were Muslims, but not all. At first, conquered Muslims were allowed to stay and continue practicing Islam, provided they register and pay a special tax similar to the jizya tax the Muslims made the Christians pay. These Muslims were called mudejars by the Christians, from the Arabic word for remain. This mudejar policy was a practical necessity for the conquerors who needed people to work their newly acquired estates, and they needed merchants to maintain the trade routes and cities continued to need workers and builders and shopkeepers. Ships needed sailors, and on it went. The Muslim citizens of the region knew how to do all that stuff, and so they would need to stay with as little disruption as possible. But over time, the relatively tolerant Mudejad policy grew more and more restrictive. The tax required to openly practice Islam went up, as did instances of persecution and worse. And eventually particularly after the defeat of the final Muslim emirate at Granada, the tax was abolished completely and all remaining Muslims in Al-Andalus were forced to convert or leave, a policy that by our standards today qualifies as ethnic cleansing. Many, perhaps most, did convert, however, and after 1492 they were known by a new name, Moriscos. These were ethnic Moors, Berbers, or Arabs, descended from migrants from North Africa who arrived after 711 AD, many not long after Tariq's original conquest. Noble Moriscos were even permitted to keep their lands and much of their wealth, and some would work their way back into the Spanish Christian ruling nobility through marriage or other means. Another group were the Mosarabs. These were Christians who were ethnically Hispano-Roman, descendants from the citizens of Roman Hispania who chose to remain after the Muslims conquered it in 720 AD and take advantage of the requirement in Islamic law that they be allowed to decline conversion provided they pay the tax. As you'll recall, these ethnically Roman Christians were never all that fond of life under the small, insulated, decadent Visigothic elites, and they decided to stay and take their chances with the Moors rather than follow the Christian nobility and others north. But while they would keep their Christian faith, they assimilated culturally into more society and found a place within one of the true gems of the Muslim world. They adopted Arabic as their primary language, developed a taste for food and fashion of the caliphate, 
their Christian liturgy evolved into a distinct rite, and they built churches and homes in the more refined Moorish Arabic style. As late as the 1300s, Mossarabs constituted a majority of the population in many parts of Al-Andalus. And so it should come as no surprise that many, perhaps most, Mossarabs and Moriscos did not feel liberated when the Christian armies reconquered Al-Andalus. Culturally speaking, the kingdoms of Castile and Aragon were steps down in their eyes from the very cosmopolitan and international Arabic-speaking Moorish world they had come to know. The new Christian overlords likewise resented the Mossarabs and Moriscos and soon came to doubt their dedication to the faith and the crown, and that never completely went away. As late as the 1700s, in fact, church and crown authorities ordered massive purges of Moriscos for the mostly imagined crime of continuing to secretly practice Islam behind closed doors. The fact that they kept track of who was a Morisco as late as the 1700s should tell you all you need to know. The overarching point I want to drive home here is that it would be a huge stretch to say that the experience of the Reconquista served to unite the Iberian Peninsula, let alone that it inspired them to spread Western civilization around the world. Spain today remains a very divided country, with the Civil War of the 1930s and the brutal 40-year dictatorship of Francisco Franco that followed still casting a shadow over politics and society. But those divisions, as we've shown, go much deeper and have their roots in the origin story of the Reconquista itself. What the Reconquista did do, however, almost as a side effect, was prepare the Christian kingdoms for what was just on the horizon. The shared experience, in a very practical sense, helped them develop the tools, the skills, and the nascent institutions that would be needed to exploit their new earned wealth and power. They may not have known it at the time, but a monumental era of unprecedented expansion was just around the corner, and the age of exploration, colonization, and conquest is about to be unleashed on an unknown and unsuspecting civilization halfway around the world. Episode 5 will be out soon.